said, we've got the best four people to talk about a tough subject, uh, not an easy subject, but something that I think uh, we are all eager to hear about how Europe is addressing this forced migration crisis. So let me thank you all again and turn to Ambassador O'Sullivan for opening thoughts. Well, thank you very much, Heather, and thank you to CSIS for organizing uh, this event, which I think is uh, an important opportunity to discuss what is, I think, one of the, 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 the great, uh, I don't want to say necessarily crisis of, of, of modern times, because crisis gives the impression that it's a kind of one-off thing, that it's, it's sort of happening now and it will be happening next year. I, I think the first observation I'd like to make is I think we have to recognize that this is something that's going to be with us for quite a long time to come. I mean, when you look at the, the number of displaced people around the world for various reasons. You look at the immediate region of Europe, somewhere around 25 million people displaced for various reasons. Uh, this is, this is uh, and this is talking about people who are forcibly uh, displaced, uh, but I think you can't disconnect that from the broader issue also of migration, broader migration and people moving, maybe not forced, but people pushed uh, uh, or, in, or in, in inclined to move because they feel that the economic prospects or their situation in their country, uh, in their home country, is not what they, what they wish for or they wish for them family. So they are uh, uh, incentivized or they are motivated to, to move to try and improve their, their standard of living or, or find a, a better way of life for themselves and their family. So uh, one is obviously a case of, of violence and, and conflict where people are driven away, but there's you know, forced is, 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 a, is a term that maybe is, is slightly malleable. Uh, for Europe, uh, clearly, given our geography, uh, we are clearly going to be the magnet uh, which will attract people. We are an oasis of stability and prosperity, uh, and uh, uh, it's inevitable that people in, 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 in the region are going to be tempted and, and want to come to Europe. And I think uh, we should, we have to be conscious, I think, of two things. One is that uh, we have, firstly, a strong commitment to uh, uh, the international uh, obligations of refugees and asylum seekers, and I think we absolutely have to retain our borders open and uh, willing to provide that asylum. Uh, and secondly, we have a demographic issue. We will need migrants, uh, uh, and migrants make a huge contribution to our society, so we have to recognize that. Uh, but thirdly, and you, you touched on this and we know it, it's a politically sensitive issue. I, I think we cannot simply sit here uh, in the comfort of this conference room and say, well, you know, we need migrants and everything is fine. We know there is resistance, there is political resistance. Some of this is frankly uh, xenophobic and, and should be pushed back. Some of it is legitimate concerns by people feeling that uh, their identity or their way of life or that their jobs might be in jeopardy from people who are willing to accept lower wages or lower standards. So I think we should not, we cannot dismiss uh, all of the populist rhetoric about this issue. Uh, uh, if we do, we're at risk of, 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 of ceding the, 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 the field, in my view, to, to the populace. And we have to also understand why there is concern in our population, particularly, I think, at the suggestion that this migration might in some way not be controlled or is completely uh, disorderly. Uh, and we, I think, saw that when we had the, the height of the crisis from the Syrian uh, uh, conflict, uh, the sense of people apparently, and I quote unquote, streaming across frontiers, the kind of television graphics that people saw, it, it made people nervous. And I think we have to accept that that's a political constraint that we have to manage uh, in trying to have a progressive and forward-looking policy uh, on this issue. Uh, I actually think uh, that while there are many criticisms that can be made of, of how we reacted to, to, to this initial, initial crisis uh, a couple of years ago, I, I think there's also a very positive side to it. Uh, and I, I particularly want to pay tribute to the enormous generosity of spirit that was shown by the people of Italy and the people of Greece uh, uh, in responding to this crisis. Uh, and frankly, they were, they were left uh, alone for too long in, in trying to deal with it uh, uh, for reasons that we know, because of course, it's important, I think, particularly for an American audience to understand this is not managed on a continental scale in Europe. This is actually managed uh, on a national level. Uh, and I think one of the things that's happened in the last few years is a recognition that managing this on a national level uh, is not a sufficient response and that no individual country is actually equipped uh, to provide the kind of response which, which is needed. But I think it's important to bear in mind that, as you say, Heather, we received um, some 650,000 asylum requests in, in 2017, down 50% from the previous year, so there's a downward trend. 
But I think it's also important to remember that we approved some 720,000 requests in 2016, and that's three times as many as the US, Canada, and Australia combined. So uh, we're also moving to resettle those in need of protection, 13,000 from Turkey, and plan to resettle 50,000 by the end of 2018. Uh, and we're also helping uh, Italy and Greece, where we have relocated 12,500 from Italy and 22,000 from, from, from Greece. Are these numbers sufficient? Should we be doing more? You know this is controversial. We have a number of member states who have declined to receive any uh, 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 people on relocation. So this is, this is a, an ongoing debate in Europe about how we manage this, uh, what kind of burden sharing we, we have between our member states. But I also think it's important to say that we have been doing our best to save and protect the lives of migrants. I know that uh, a number of people, I think around 5,000, have lost their, their lives crossing the Mediterranean. But I think it's important to say that we've saved nearly 300,000. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes that number gets quoted less frequently than, than the number of people who've, who've lost their lives. Of course, the loss of any life is, is a tragedy. But we know that in many cases, this is the result of the, the, the negligence and the some kind of deliberate negligence of the smugglers uh, and, the, and the people cruelly exploiting uh, these, these refugees. Now, what are we doing to, to address this? Well, as you say, we have attempted to um, put more order into the way in which uh, the arrival of people is managed at our frontiers to help uh, the frontline states, Italy and, and Greece in particular. That's why we've created the European Border and Coast Guard Service to uh, provide uh, 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 additional resources to member states who find themselves overstretched. Uh, we have put in place a more uh, orderly and, and uh, well-managed system of registration of uh, people seeking asylum, uh, and also from a security point of view, checking these against our databases and being able to demonstrate that we're paying attention also to the, the risk, which is not, not huge, but which is there, uh, of people abusing of this opportunity uh, for, for other purposes. Um, we have also uh, looking at the reform of the common uh, European asylum system. I think we understand we need uh, to rethink how we manage this uh, going forward because the way in which it's managed at the present time puts an excessive burden on the countries of first, first receipt, uh, particularly those who are in the front line like Italy, Italy and Greece in this particular instance. Uh, and we also need to uh, uh, work on uh, incre increasing the legal pathways of, of migration so that uh, uh, people are, are less inclined to take the illegal path if they feel there are more opportunities through the legal way. Finally, and this I think is really the, 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 one of the key things, we also need to address the root causes. I mean, this is, uh, 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 now we know that where this is, involves conflict, uh, we know, for example, we take the Syria situation, uh, the European Union is the largest donor of humanitarian assistance uh, to the Syrian crisis, uh, over, over 10 billion euros. Uh, but I mean, this is, this is fine and we're doing our best, but I mean, you need to solve the problem. We need peace in Syria and we need a political process, but this is elusive. Uh, and the EU alone cannot deliver this. We are active in doing this through the Geneva process, uh, working with other partners, but I mean, so far it has eluded us. Uh, and as, uh, as long as peace uh, in Syria is elusive, there will continue to be outflows of people. And we know that uh, the, the, the immediate brunt of that, of course, has been borne by the immediate neighbors, Jordan, Lebanon, and, and Turkey, who've had to do uh, enormous work uh, in, in, in taking in huge numbers. So whether it's Libya, Syria, Myanmar, we have to try and find a political process that puts an end to the initial violence and, and conflict that, that drives people out before you can start to create a better society and where, where, where refugees could wish to return. Uh, equally, we need to invest. Uh, we are the largest donor of development assistance globally, uh, and we have started to uh, uh, also orientate that in a way that helps countries uh, who face outflows of particularly economic migrants or people who feel uh, motivated and incentivized to move because of poor economic opportunities. And this is particularly true in Africa where we have uh, started uh, uh, an investment fund, a trust fund uh, uh, with uh, over three and a half billion euros. Uh, and uh, we're also uh, looking at an investment plan which would seek to involve uh, the private sector in, in improving economic opportunities. Now, of course, this is never going to solve the problem completely, uh, but I think we need to work uh, with the countries of origin, particularly of people who are not leaving because of conflict, but rather because of economic, uh, poor economic opportunities. Uh, as I say, to provide legal pathways, but also to uh, help them 
provide more opportunities uh, and more, more hope for the future in, in their countries. Because fundamentally, people don't want to, to, people prefer to remain in their own country if given a choice. So I think we need to understand this. Uh, this so this is, frankly, uh, I think we have come a long way since the peak of the crisis in 2015. Uh, frankly, I think Europe deserves a little more credit than we sometimes get for the way in which we have managed this crisis, which has not been easy. Uh, uh, but I've no complacency and no smugness. Uh, this is a big challenge, uh, and our geography puts us in a particularly responsible place uh, in relation to this, uh, and I think we will need to continue to work on this, both our obligations to refugees, asylum seekers, uh, and the, the importance of providing always a, a haven for those people, the need to manage properly uh, 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 the issue of illegal migration and, and, and normal and, and economic migration, and the need to establish uh, clearer pathways of legal migration for the, for, for the very real needs which we will have uh, going into the future for our economy and given our demographics. I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you. That was a fantastic overview. Let me turn to Liz and to, for some comments as you're focusing and working with NGOs and, and the Dublin regulations. You, are, you have a bird's eye view. So Liz, to, over to you. Thank you very much, Heather, and thank you for the invitation to be here. I was an intern at CSIS more uh, years ago than I wish to contemplate. So I'm getting flashbacks today. I thought I'd be sat in a panel here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the EU response to the migration crisis from a broader perspective of viewing the migration crisis as what became a transboundary crisis. So not thinking of it as a migration phenomenon, but trying to understand it as, as a crisis phenomenon. Um, and I say this because we've just uh, completed some work that was commissioned by the Council of the European Union to reflect upon how the EU institutions themselves managed to respond and coordinate to what was a very rapid escalation of a number of, uh, of inflows, uh, less across the central Mediterranean, but, but more across the eastern Mediterranean, um, from Turkey to Greece. Um, the idea of crisis is, of course, contested, and I think it's, it is fair to talk about the numbers that arrived in Europe compared to the rest of the world, the number of refugees Europe is being asked to host relative to its own total population, um, and ask the question of, of, did this really warrant the level of, of panic and political fallout, and political fallout that we're still experiencing electorally that has been seen across Europe. Um, but at the same time, the speed of movement, the sheer exponential increase over the summer of 2015 and the numbers arriving on very, very small, ill-equipped islands in Greece and moving across the Western Balkans with almost no external support um, the lack of preparedness within the EU, the lack of realization that this was happening at an early enough point, and the fact that the EU itself was not set up to be an operational responder to these types of flows. It has been a legislative actor primarily in the area of migration, um, really brought home the idea that, that this did become a crisis for the European Union. It became a humanitarian crisis on the ground and how to respond and ensure people are kept safe and a challenge to the legal setup of the European Union and asylum systems that are not designed to deal with large fluctuations in applications year on year. It's designed to deal steadily and comprehensively with individual claims. This is not how Europe has perceived its role in terms of protection. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Dublin, partly because I'm seeing this week in DC as a vacation from Brussels and a little bit of a psychological <laughs> break from the unbelievable navel-gazing that Dublin, has Dublin reform process has created. Suffice to say, Dublin reform, even if heralded as a fix, is not going to be a fix. Even if we get something in June at the, at the European summit, it will not be a fix to this problem. It has to be seen in, a, in, in the context of a broad range of challenges facing the European Union and, and a broad range of responses that are needed. Um, but I'm happy to go into that later on. Um, the idea of a European response, as, as, as the ambassador pointed out, is, is a tricky one for, for the EU to respond. On the one hand, it was very clear that countries were looking to the EU for guidance and direction during the crisis from a fairly early stage, particularly the smaller states under pressure. At the same time, the EU is not a sovereign entity and it has to respect the autonomy of those EU member states. However much Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Sweden would like them to storm into Greece and sort everything out, they need the permission of the Greek government to do that. So there is a dance that goes on between the EU and the national level when it comes to crisis response of requesting permission to act and working in, in strong collaboration. And that also in the, in the field of migration is, is a new endeavor. 
uh, for the EU. So it's not always as, as straightforward as why isn't the EU acting? It's, it's also how, how far can they, they do this? Some of the things we, we found when we were, we were interviewing around between 30 and 40 senior officials, um, and, and they all gave us their stories, and everyone has their own narrative of how the crisis was uh, unfolded to, uh, from their own perspectives. Very keen to talk about their own story, um, though we may have created some flashbacks that they weren't really um, prepared for. And I think one of the things that was very challenging in the first months of the crisis uh, was that there was no clear narrative on how to respond. There was a great deal of uncertainty and discrepancy about how different actors felt that, felt, felt there should be a response. And this quickly coalesced in the European Union into a conversation about whether borders should be open or closed, with uh, leaders such as Orban in Hungary talking about closing borders entirely and sealing borders, and other actors talking about the need to be able to wave through individuals from Greece through the Western Balkans and, and eventually uh, welcome them in Germany. And it's, it's an entirely false dichotomy that was set up and became very pervasive and I think created a lot of uncertainty in the European Union about what the correct response was. Borders are always managed. They are never completely open and they are never completely closed, however much a leader might say they are. Um, you have to think about how you manage very carefully the security elements of that, the ability to uh, allow people access to protection, and then offer, offer reception and support once people have arrived. It's a very complex issue, but you also have to have a strong narrative in a crisis that underpins the action you then take. And we saw a great deal of hesitation from September all the way through, I think, to October, and also discrepancy coming from different EU institutions. The European Commission had one perspective on how crisis should be managed. The European Council had another perspective on how that should be managed. And as ever within the European Union, into Inter-institutional fighting sometimes overtook um, the very real issues at hand. Um, when a narrative did emerge, I think it was also hamstrung by the idea that there was no clear leader, there was no migration coordinator, no one person who was going to lead a response at the EU level. We saw over the period of, uh, from July through to October, an absence of leadership, a lot of people running around doing lots of different things, very little coordination across portfolios and a lot of challenges in terms of dictating a policy in Brussels and then being able to translate it operationally on the ground. Um, and uh, some of these reasons are prosaic. The EU has typically, when it's first encountering a crisis, had to make up crisis response mechanisms on the spot and are then ready for the next crisis. So this was a process of, of evolution for the European Union into becoming an operational body and learning how to coordinate but it was also a function of more prosaic issues, which is much of this happened in August, and anyone who spent time in Brussels in August will know it's a ghost town, and no one's there to actually take leadership. So a combination of issues meant there was quite a delay in responding. But there are also challenges in terms of the tools that the European Union has to respond to crisis, and, and here money becomes a big issue. Um, at, at the beginning of this budget cycle, 20 million euros was set aside for emergency actions within the asylum, migration, and integration fund. Um, that 20 million didn't go very far, in case you were wondering. And there was an enormous creativity within the European Commission to pull money from different funds to be able to support states in being able to, to then produce the very real resources, tents, blankets, uh, reception facilities, uh, at the national level that were needed to, to respond to this crisis. However, giving a country money doesn't necessarily mean that can be translated into resources, particularly if that state is under pressure to the extent that Greece was. Um, and we saw that while the money was translated into, transferred into bank accounts, it wasn't necessarily then being spent effectively. And the EU is really going to have to ask itself some questions about what kind of standing resources it will need in the future. It is, it is, it was, Quite impressive to see how quickly there were responses in terms and creativity in terms of finding money, pieces of money and being a little bit creative with the accounting, but also then making sure that that was spent effectively, that's an enormous challenge that remains uh, for the European Union. Um, and just turning externally and, and to some of the things that we've been working on uh, with CSIS in our projects and looking at the external financing, um, what we saw was an in, several large new shiny instruments being created, such as the Emergency Trust Fund for Africa, um, the facilities for refugees in Turkey, 
um, much of which required EU funding and then contributions from member states. Um, they're not always as they seem. It's not always new money. Sometimes it's um, repurposed money. For example, the 1 billion euros uh, dedicated by the EU for the facility for refugees in Turkey is actually pre-accession funding that was already earmarked for Turkey and then later on re-pledged at a conference uh, for Syria donors in London. So the same money was sort of branded three times. It's not always an exponential increase in money. Sometimes it's just uh, being moved around. So we're seeing quite a lot of recycling. We've seen the EU member states talk a good game about contributing to some of these uh, trust funds and initiatives, but then really struggling to actually find the money in their budgets to make a real contribution. And many of them are reluctant to contribute to EU funds because they'd rather retain autonomy over how they spend this money uh, uh, outside the European Union. Uh, we've looked at, at the effectiveness of spending at the EU, and I think here, you know, there really is a, a strong need to, to rethink how money is spent, the capacity of partners to absorb that money. Um, it, large sums of money can look good, but if there's no ability to spend it, there is no governance structure in the partner country to absorb that money and translate it into to real benefit, then that's enormously challenging, and it's a challenge that's, that's come up for EU actors time and again. But also, it depends on the goals and the clarity. The, the clarity is the objectives that have been set out by the European Union. Um, it's also striking that, that while there, is, uh, there are several new shiny funds that have been created by the European Union, and particular regional focuses, such as Libya, Niger, and the Chad Basin, UNHCR is also reporting critical underfunding of their own humanitarian programs in that area. So there is a, a focus on certain objectives within the European Union, but not necessarily the willingness to contribute to, to humanitarian programming. And there may be good reasons for that, but I think we need to understand why, uh, why there is this discrepancy between, between how, how certain things are funded. And just to finish off, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always struck by, by the goals articulated and, and the root causes question, because I really struggle with the concept of root causes and whether it is meaningful, particularly in this context. What we've uh, researched at MPI is that, that, that the local context of migration, the local context socioeconomically, the habit of migration that exists in some, in some parts of the world and not in others, um, the particular drivers for migration are many varied and, and shift. That The idea of addressing blanket root causes is not often thought through. A lot of money is spent without really thinking through what, what the likely effects would be. Um, and we've also seen a number of programs which, which then sit in conflict with each other. So we are simultaneously looking in Niger, for example, of projects that are designed to reduce cross-border travel while improve local economic mobility. And it's very difficult to achieve both of those goals simultaneously without really considering all the various economic factors. Many of the people who may cross borders on a daily basis in that region may be doing so in order to maintain a livelihood, not necessarily move on to Libya, move on to Europe, and be subject to, to, to uh, the EU's sort of understanding of migration. So how do we reconcile those conflicts in terms of programs? How do you sharpen goals and create benchmarks that when we look back on this period in five years' time, we can say we set a benchmark and we achieved that benchmark? I think that's still very, very vague. Um, and to really understand how the EU, as an operational actor, can become a crisis responder in this area, bearing in mind that we are likely to see greater volatility in migration flows in the future, but the next crisis will not look like this one. So if we wait to prepare for an identical uh, re-emergence of flows across the Eastern Med that look like they currently do, we will fail to respond to the next crisis and still be looking backwards rather than forwards. And I'll leave it there. Liz, thanks so much. Great food for thought there. Jonathan, the view from the UN. Um, well, good afternoon. And thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. I, I, I was on a similar panel here in this very room uh, about six months ago, also on forced migration, where I decided to speak about something slightly different. And you've invited me back. So I, I'm going to take, <laughs> take the same liberty. Um, uh, if I may, because, you know, I think if, if, we're to, if we're to develop effective policies, which is not to say some of the policies that are in place are, are, are not effective, if we are to develop effective policies, we need to know what it is we are um, uh, developing them for. 
uh, and I continue to see um, a lot of confusion, certainly terminological confusion out there when we discuss uh, 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 the issue of migration. Uh, is the crisis that we are dealing with uh, one of forced migration? What is forced migration? I'll get to that uh, in a minute. Is it simply a refugee asylum uh, crisis? Is it a crisis of irregular migration or illegal migration? You can take your pick there. Or is it a crisis of migration generally? Often we use these terms, all of us. I'm not sitting here lecturing, I do it as well. We all use these terms uh, interchangeably when in fact I think that probably muddies thinking uh, rather than helps uh, clarify it. Um, and in fact, I am relatively new to the migration field, so it's exceptionally intimidating speaking after uh, uh, Liz. Um, but it strikes me that this is a field that is heavily riven with a binary discourse, which again, I don't always believe is helpful in developing effective uh, policy approaches. So to give you some examples, are you a refugee or are you an economic migrant? Uh, are you a regular migrant or irregular? Legal or illegal? Are you forced or are you voluntary? Uh, is your country one of origin or is it one of destination? Uh, this type of discourse um, obscures the whole range of nuance uh, that exists in people's decision or compulsion uh, to move, most particularly, um, or their status as it changes uh, over time. Secondly, it might be more productive to discuss European or frankly any perspectives on, on the question um, uh, um, of migration rather than as towards a migration crisis. And I say this because in fact that may encourage a slightly more proactive rather than uh, reactive uh, uh, outlook. Migration is an overwhelmingly positive development. All indicators across the board suggest that. Um, nonetheless, there are challenges. Within this overwhelmingly healthy entity, there are various pathologies that we, we need to um, need to address. Now, I would suggest that this issue of uh, the refugee crisis, fourth crisis, is likely to be a temporary phenomenon. Previous ones typically um, uh, have been. Um, but the challenges around migration, whether that's born of demographic trends, of labor needs, uh, Europe's sense of itself as an international uh, actor, uh, are likely to remain with us and even in some cases intensify um, uh, over time. Now, on, you know, and, and none of this is to dismiss the issue of forced migration. It clearly is a, a, an issue. It raises hugely legitimate concerns uh, for states, uh, as well as, frankly, existential ones for the individual migrants whose uh, <laughs> migratory route is forced. Uh, and I would agree very much with David that I think the crisis around 2015 was probably not one so much of numbers, though that was an intense influx in a short period of time, but really rather the perception and in some cases the reality of a, of a, loss, of, uh, of a loss of control. I'd also like to point out, maybe self-evident, but it's never stopped me before, um, that forced migration is not the only form of vulnerability that migrants face. In fact, most migrants faced, face diminished uh, security. Uh, many migrants move in a regular fashion, but find themselves, for example, in exploitative uh, labor situations. Um, so again, the focus on forced migration, understandable, narrows the prism by which we view and understand uh, the challenges uh, out there. Um, and also, I think, in developing approaches to forced migration, it's, it's important to, to understand what it is. We already have a legal framework out there. We shouldn't forget that. 
again, may be obvious, but I'll say it. There is a very well-developed refugee framework going back to the 1951 convention um, that has been broadened uh, since then. I would suggest that the idea that we are in a current international climate to broaden this legal definition, whilst it may be desirable, would, is utterly uh, unrealistic. Um, but equally, I don't think it is credible to suggest that simply because you don't fit the definition of being a refugee, that your decision to move or otherwise cannot be forced. And I think the, the classic example of this will be as we um, really come to terms with the impact of, of climate change. So the reality is that, that many people do leave their homes, I think, on the basis of no credible choice, irrespective of whether or not they qualify for international uh, uh, protection. And it's this issue of mixed flows that I think that really has presented Europe, but also uh, other places um, uh, with particular uh, challenges. Um, but if the issue is actually, in fact, the challenge of irregular migration, and I suspect, though I would welcome David and Liz's views, well, everyone's views, I suspect irregular migration is more the issue in Europe than one of forced uh, uh, migration, then I'm not sure it's going to be resolved <laughs> simply by having a single straightforward focus uh, on the former, on forced migration. I think we need to develop a, a panoply of approaches that, again, to echo what David said, that reinforces the humanitarian imperative to save lives, firstly, to identify those who um, are eligible for international protection, and then, frankly, come to the realization that even once you have done that, there will be a large group of people out there for whom return home is unlikely to be feasible or possible, for whom their current situation in transit is untenable, and for whom the only solutions are, are going to have to be grounded in, in those solutions developed through international cooperation uh, and solidarity. Um, secondly, I think it is important to situate talk of crisis within its proper context. This is domestically febrile uh, in Europe. Um, whether there has been sufficient and sustained political leadership in highlighting the positive dimensions of migration over time, I think is a open uh, question. Thirdly, I think we need um, absolutely to reduce uh, the necessity by which people migrate, though I would very much echo what Liz said on the challenges around the root causes uh, uh, approach. And finally, we need to expand legal pathways. The more that you can regularize migration, the more likely you are going to be to be able to tamp down the challenges and the impetus to move in an irregular fashion. And it is those irregular routes that I think subvert the rule of law uh, and encourage a notion of a migratory uh, policy uh, that is out of control. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, Jeremy, you have the unenviable task of uh, speaking after three great speakers, but I have to say, as Liz was mentioning about the repackaging of aid, and sometimes I thought, oh, the U.S. government is not familiar with that particular practice, are we? No. no, I no think it's all new money. Exactly. Always. always new money. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, so, uh, great comments um, uh, from the other panelists. I agree. I think I, I, I agree broadly with, with, with all that's been said. Um, I think it's Im it's important to keep a few things in mind as we as we talk about this. Um, first, Liz's point on on scale is quite important. Um, you know, there was that giant surge during the summer of, of 2015 um, that made a lot of headlines. But when you look at the raw numbers, the bulk of the burden of refugees is still being borne 
uh, not by Europe, not by the US, but by the frontline states that are adjacent to the, the, the refugee producing countries themselves. So the, um, for all of the, um, you know, for all of the, the, the refugees that Germany has welcomed, um, and uh, I think it's over a million at this point, um, Turkey has welcomed three times as many with the same population, with, with the same base population as, as Germany has. Um, the, the population of refugees in, uh, in Lebanon today is estimated to be about a million registered and probably about a million and a half Syrians total. Uh, that's out of a population of six million, so a an equivalent to a quarter of the population. Um, that'd be as if there were 20 million refugees in Germany. So it, the, the, the numbers in the frontline states are, are immense, and um, it's not in any way to diminish the good work um, that the ambassador talked about and some of the, the, the useful tools that Europe is developing, but I think it's also important to keep in perspective that we are still very far from any sort of equitable global burden sharing on this issue. Um, second general point I wanna make is that our rhetoric and how we talk about this matters. Uh, Jonathan talked about that in terms of how we characterize types of migration. It's also important in how we characterize um, the nature of migration. So when we use words like flood, um, tide, things like this, the, this notion of an invasion, um, that plays into the kind of negative demagoguery that, that, that um, then leads to the, you know, the sort of rhetoric we're seeing in Hungary and so on. So it's very important we watch how we talk about this. Um, and frankly, you know, we see this in our own country. Um, there's, some, there, there, there's someone on Twitter who tends to use those sorts of words about migrants quite a lot. Um, I forget his name. Um, uh, but I wanna, I wanna talk about root causes. You know, I, I come out of a, a humanitarian aid and disaster response background. I was at USAID when, um, when this was such a, an enormous, uh, enormous story, an enormous uh, issue um, in the last few years of the Obama administration and um, had, had dialogue during that period with our European counterparts about how we, could, how we could manage this. And I think our sense at that time was that a lot of what was driving the migration was the, you know, the, the, the failure to resolve the Syria crisis, the failure to effectively and adequately deploy aid tools um, uh, to support that population. My views on that are evolving now pretty considerably and um, heavily informed by some research that colleagues of mine at the Center for Global Development have done. Uh, Michael Clemens and Hannah Postel have done really seminal work looking at the links between aid policy uh, and, and particularly development aid and people's propensity to migrate. And uh, it really challenges a lot of the, basic, uh, the baseline assumptions that we had within the US administration and I think that the EU has been working from over the last few years. So, um, and that's really important because whether you whether you think migration is a good thing or a bad thing, and I tend to think that if it's well managed, it's generally a good thing. Whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, if you're going to try to use tools to in some way constructively manage that, you, you do want to have a sense of the causality of how those tools will affect migration, and, and, and there has not been a great evidence base for that um, in forming policy making. So a couple lessons that come out of the recent research on that, um, very relevant to the whole root causes question. The first is that development aid to the extent that it is useful in curtailing migration, it is probably only useful on about a 30 to 40 year timeline, not on a five to 10 year timeline. So on a five to 10 year timeline, what you generally see is that national income, as national incomes rise, as a country goes from being um, uh, in extreme poverty to being middle income, you actually see an uptick in, in, in migration. And that is because the, um, the, the income disparity between that state and a place like Europe or the US is great in either scenario, but the ability to migrate, the ability to afford to migrate, increases as national incomes grow. So the, the appeal, the propensity to migrate may stay roughly constant, constant, but the ability to migrate, the ability to afford to migrate goes up considerably. Um, one of the factors that is thought to have spurred the, the, the big, um, uh, the large numbers of migrants who were, who were, um, who were entering Europe in 2015 was the fact that the, the, the Turkey to Greece route was considerably safer and cheaper than the Libya to Italy route. And so it became more feasible and that, that um, the, the cost and the danger of migrating dropped and so pe more people did it. Um, so that means that you know, there are very good reasons why in investing in development progress in migrant producing countries m may be a good idea. It's, there's certainly good, um, good humanitarian and solidarity reasons to do that. 
but we probably shouldn't expect that that's going to have much of an, an impact in terms of mitigating migrant flows. And if anything, it's going to probably increase migration out of those countries. Um, and that is going, that trend will continue up until the country reaches a, a, a purchasing parity level of income equivalent to about eight to 10,000 US dollars per year, which is going to take decades in many of these migrant producing countries. Um, second, uh, second big takeaway from some of the recent research is that violence matters a great deal to individual decisions to migrate. And so uh, uh, work that research that has been done looking at the um, unaccompanied minor, the surge in unaccompanied minor migration from Central America into the United States in the last few years found that when you hold, uh, hold economic factors and other, other factors um, constant, an, a, a, a rapid uptick in violence in a community would, would produce significantly, um, significantly more migrant, um, my, um, significantly more migrants. So um, that's interesting. Uh, obviously, it's interesting just in its own right, but it's interesting because that's something that you could plausibly potentially affect with, uh, with aid interventions. You know, the, the, the evidence is mixed, but there is more, um, you know, there is, there is more evidence to suggest that that is something that's amenable to, uh, to uh, an aid intervention. Um, there is a lot more experimentation that's needed. There's a lot more research that's needed, but there, but there is a, you know, there is a, some growing body of practice to suggest that well-targeted, well-designed aid programs can reduce community level violence. And uh, reducing community level violence will probably have a greater impact on um, reducing people's propensity to migrate than economic development in those communities. Um, third, and the ambassador touched on this already, is that obviously conflict matters an enormous amount. And the fact that uh, global conflict, uh, conflict resolution mechanisms have been uh, functionally broken in recent years is a big factor in this. Um, it's no coincidence that the countries that have produced the, the largest numbers of, of new migrants to Europe in recent years are Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Um, there's a common thread in all those countries, and it's our failure to effectively resolve and prevent large-scale conflict. That's also not an area that's terribly amenable to aid interventions. Um, you know, we, we should be, uh, I, you know, I, I come from a disaster response background. I firmly believe we should be spraying as much humanitarian aid at those countries as we can absolutely afford, but we should be doing that not because we think it's going to mitigate migration, because it won't. We should be doing that because it's the right thing to do, it's the ethical thing to do. Um, it, there's, a, you know, there's a global burden sharing component to that. Um, we should absolutely do that, but if we want to s reduce people's propensity to migrate, then the answer is resolving those conflicts. And, um, that's, that's proving very, very difficult. You know, if you think about the, uh, I think there's some interesting, it's an imperfect parallel, but there are some interesting parallels between the Balkans conflicts in the 90s and the Syria conflict today in terms of the regional dynamics, the regional impact, uh, proximity to Europe, and so on. You know, the war in Bosnia went on for four years, was resolved, uh, and people began to be able to go home. We're now in year seven in Syria. There's no end in sight, and it could, plausibly drag on for many, many more years yet. Um, we've been in Afghanistan now for 17 years. Um, we've fought a one-year war 17 times in Afghanistan. And, um, and that, shows, that shows no end in sight either. So um, I think basically this is a problem, this is a challenge. Um, this irregular migration challenge is a challenge that will be with us for the foreseeable future. Um, we need a lot more research and a lot more rigor about how we think about um, uh, the policy tools available for managing that. And, um, um, you know, and there are, there are good reasons why deploying aid tools towards countries that are suffering from conflict and producing migrants is a good idea, um, but managing migration is probably not near the top of the list. Jeremy, fantastic, and that is really, uh, really important research that I th we're looking forward to hearing more uh, that CGD produces on that. We have about 10 minutes uh, for some q and I'm going to give our panelists one question while they're thinking of that. I'd love to go out into the audience and bundle two or three, and then we'll let everyone uh, have a quick response. So I would like to challenge all four of you to tell me what the future holds. We just spent a lot of time thinking about responses to 2015, moving from crisis to a long-term framework. 
I will tell you the two things that I fear about the future, but I want you to all give me encouragement, because uh, we always leave every panel at CSIS with words of encouragement. Um, it, my concern is, and maybe this, Ambassador Sullivan, to you, I worry that migration has really been incredibly destructive to EU cohesiveness. This is not, the, you know, the East versus the West, but also the extraordinary pressure on the South, Greece and Italy. It, it, that's my one concern. The second concern, I'm worried that these wonderful, generous instruments um, are actually being mobilized to suppress migration, and that can have some implications for governance, rule of law. Certainly civil society and some of the human rights communities have expressed concern about this, and I, maybe it's, it's something that I shouldn't be concerned about, but those are my two. But each tell me what the future holds on this migration crisis. Okay, we have a few minutes. Who would like to ask our panel? Some questions. Yes, sir, we'll have one there and one there, please. Matt's coming up. And if you could please introduce yourself and very quickly pose a question so we can get right to answer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jared Struble. I'm with Penn State University. Um, this is a question for the whole panel. Um, you mentioned that so the EU is developing uh, procedures to tackle the crisis, but you've mentioned that most of the burden is being borne by um, so-called frontline states. So has there been considerations to help develop the capacity within these states to help refugees and uh, forced migrants. Thank you. Um, Matt, right there, right from the front. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Astrid Luz. I'm from the private sector, and I invest in West Africa. I also lived in West Africa many years, and I'm Spanish. So um, my question is, what has been commented as the, the countries in Europe that now uh, receive the most illegal and all types of migration are Greece and Italy. Before that, it was Spain, through the Canary Islands and through the from Morocco. Uh, the migration routes have migrated. So, what did Spain do uh, to force migration of those migration routes? And is what Spain did? positive or negative, because in terms of Senegal, for example, which was a priority country for Spain in terms of illegal uh, migration, um, they focused a lot of resources in terms of aid, but also uh, Coast Guard. Um, did that, that pushed the migration route from Senegal, now it goes up through Niger and then through Libya. So. Did uh, what Spain do, was it positive, negative? Thank you so much. All right, three questions. Ambassador Sullivan, I'll have you lead off, and we'll just go right down the panel. <coughs> I mean, there's, there's an awful lot could be said. I, I think in response to the last question, um, th there were two things that drove the, the, the latest wave. Uh, one was the collapse of the political authority in Libya, which, which made Libya a sort of free transit zone, and that is why we've had a lot of focus recently on uh, a naval operation in, in that vicinity and on working with such authorities as we can find in Libya to try to, to manage that better. The other is, as, as has been said, uh, that the Syrian displacement uh, uh, into, and I absolutely agree that uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey bore, bore the brunt of the immediate uh, uh, consequences in terms of millions of, of refugees, the European Union was the single largest donor to the camps in those areas and to the international effort. The United States also made a, a big contribution. Uh, one of the problems was that in 2015, the money started to run out. Uh, it became very clear that there was not enough money in the camps to, for the World Food Program, for example, said they could not continue to feed people. So there was a sort of exodus, and at that point you started, and this is where you get the, the relationship that Jonathan and, and, and Jeremy have mentioned, that. Um, once you get a flow, once you get a channel, uh, then other people piggyback on it. So there was an initial flow through Turkey I into the Balkans and then into Greece, uh, which started a sort of route, which people frankly then saw was successful. I mean, it was, it was working. And then you suddenly found, for example, that we got a lot of uh, 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 Afghans coming from Iran. We got a lot of people coming from elsewhere. So you, you kind of get this, this momentum which builds, and you also get the smugglers network, which then creates the, these flows. So that's what we've been, that's what we've been trying to deal with. On, on Heather's point about uh, EU cohesive, yeah, I mean, 
I, I think uh, Liz described it very well. This is a challenge, a, a governance challenge for the European Union because this is not typically something which we've managed at continental level or at EU level other than in, leg in, in legislative terms. We've never had an operational responsibility. The European Union does not manage border guards. The European Union does not have a police force. The European Union now has a, a, an incipient border and coast guard service, but it's only, it's only, it's only, it's only beginning. Uh, and uh, this is this is typically, unfortunately, the way uh, Europe works. We are faced with a crisis. We suddenly discover that we need more European instruments. And as Liz said, then we have to invent this and we have to build it up. We have to make it work. Uh, we have done a lot to help Italy and, and Greece, not as much as I personally would have wished, but I mean, we have reinforced their capacity to manage and to uh, monitor and to control the flows and the intakes and the way people are managed. We've given additional funds, but I must say the conditions, particularly on the Greek islands, are not optimal, and that's not the, the, the reluctance of, of the Greek people, but it's because of the sort of conditions which arise. We still have a long way to go in terms of, in terms of making all of this work better. But there is, and I think this is very important, as Liz said, there's this tension between the fact that member states do not want to simply hand all this over to the EU and let us run it. Uh, if we were if we were sitting here in this room, the four of us, we could probably design a system that would work perfectly, uh, but that's not the way, that's not real life. Real life is this complex interaction between the decision-making process in Brussels and the reality of member states on the ground who, on the one hand, want help, but on the other hand, still want to retain a high degree of control over, over what they're doing. And, and getting that right and getting that articulation is frankly messy and, and complicated. And uh, uh, it's gonna take us uh, another while to, to to, to, to get this right. I think we've made huge progress. That's why I say I think we don't sometimes get the credit, but I agree it's far from perfect and uh, it's something which is gonna need continuous work because I think the one thing that's emerged from all of this is this is not a problem that's gonna go away. We may have an immediate problem of Syria, but this is a constant issue which we're gonna face over the next 20, 30, 40 years uh, and we're gonna have to uh, <coughs> do better at uh, making this into a, a functioning system which enables us not to always live this as a kind of crisis, but rather to manage it on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. And on terms of the cohesiveness, yes, this is a challenge of getting uh, all our member states to feel a sense of solidarity and not just the frontline states, bearing in mind that most of the refugees who arrive in Italy and Greece don't actually want to spend, stay in Italy or Greece. That's another problem we have, that in many cases, the asylum seekers, uh, it's not just a question of I want to be safe when I first land. They have a pretty clear idea of where they want to go. They want to go to Germany or they want to go to Sweden or they want to go to the Netherlands they've worked out where you actually get some of the most generous uh, conditions, and I understand this, and this is another problem because then you, it's not just a question of providing facilities on the first instance, but you've got this challenge that people say, well, actually, I'd much rather be somewhere else, and this is also a challenge for the, the, the authorities in the first instance because they're actually having to almost restrain people from leaving their country, which is not what they, what they, what they want to do. So it's, a, it's, a, it's extremely complex, uh, I think, we have made a lot of progress, but we've a, we've, we've a lot of work still to do to, to get this right and better. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna to come to your question last. But when it comes to um, EU helping frontline states, I think there are sort of two main areas where, where there has been support, um, but it, there is a fundamental trade-off uh, route. So the European Union has put in place a number of different concepts that were set out in the European agenda on migration, notably the concept of hotspots this idea that EU agencies could come together and coordinate and support national countries in the initial registration, fingerprinting, and, 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 and management of arrivals in Italy and Greece. Those have developed in a very organic way, each individual hotspot, even if they're only a few kilometers away, because it, this is the first foray, really, for the European Commission itself to oversee a project that brings agencies together in a very operational way, but also work with national officials. So it is playing out exactly this tension between EU and national. Um, and that has worked better in some areas than others, and they play out differently, substantially differently in Italy than in Greece, because in Italy the Italian government plays a stronger role than in Greece, where the capacity is much less strong to be able to, to they, they sort of, handed over quite a lot of responsibility to the European Union. The other part of that is the very contentious discussion on relocation, which is the quid pro quo. We'll let you set up hotspots in Italy and Greece, but you're going to give us something in return, and, and relocation was that informal bargain. We will take some of those asylum seekers and try to redistribute them across the European Union. So that's sort of the EU level mechanism, but at the same time, one of the fundamental things that, that has kind of been ignored in all of this is, is the fact that the crisis revealed some fundamental weaknesses within asylum systems. 
of all different types. So the level of reception capacity, the ability to actually just receive people, um, the length of asylum processes and appeals procedures. It is extremely slow in Italy, it's very sclerotic. You can spend years in an asylum procedure, which doesn't really help if you're then denied asylum at the end of that process. You've been in the country perhaps even eight years. So working with the government to improve the functioning of the asylum system has been critical in Italy and as part of the implementation of the EU-Turkey deal has been a critical part in Greece. But this is where the game theory comes in because if you were the, a Greek official, you would have absolutely no interest in improving your asylum system because the moment Greece gets good at asylum, the rest of the EU is going to walk away. And this is the problem that the EU cannot seem to overcome and it goes to the heart of all the conversations which is there is strong national interest in not being very good at this because the countries that are good, Sweden, Germany, have tended to, 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 to take on the bulk of responsibility and, and how do we manage that? Um, in Spain, I mean, Spain is fascinating. Spain has had a number of agreements, not just with Senegal, but with Morocco, um, and they've really invested in very informal, very deep relationships that aren't written down for the most part. This is very informal cooperation because it's important for partner countries not to have uh, the EU waving around pieces of paper saying these, these countries have agreed to cooperate with us because their own nationals are not particularly comfortable with their governments cooperating with the EU. And so Spain has, uh, has, has invested in deep informal partnerships on how to manage flows across the Western Mediterranean, whether that results in returns, how they, how they deal with that, how far Morocco and Senegal themselves police um, departures. Um, and I think it's important to note that while there does tend to be a shift in trends over time between whether the central Mediterranean is the key crossing point, the eastern Mediterranean or the western Mediterranean, they're not always the same populations. And, and the, up tr the upswing in arrivals along the western Mediterranean into Spain at the end of last year, if you look at the nationalities, they are not the same nationalities who are crossing the central Mediterranean. So there seems to be a much stronger West African flow, which seems to be a different population than has been going through, through Libya or in, in the people who've been in Libya for a while and leaving. So um, it, it's not always a pendulum swing. Sometimes it's different dynamics. Um, and, and I think as Jeremy said, you know, uh, cost and danger and, and desire uh, all play into that. And uh, it's really hard to be optimistic. Um, really? Okay, I'm gonna put this in a really negative way with a bit of optimism at the end. Um, the idea of the EU-Turkey deal in March 2016 was to give the EU breathing space to get its house in order, which it has singularly failed to do because as soon as the EU deal started working, everyone went, now what else were we talking about? And it has been forgotten politically that the, 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 the panic levels went below the waterline and everyone sort of moved back to, to, to uh, their old idiosyncratic ways of doing things. Um, this has left us with quite a big challenge because as you noted, there are some fundamental discrepancies in understanding what solidarity means. Uh, for Southern European member states, they want a different mechanism for re responsibility sharing. For several Central European states, they are questioning even whether refugee hosting is something they want to do. But for the Schengen area within the European Union, upon which all of this is based, and the reason you have a common European asylum system is not because the Europeans are nice, but because they needed one in order to make the Schengen system function. The rules of Schengen were devised by a group of states who all had in their DNA the understanding that refugee protection was important. And um, at the end of the day, it's Schengen has now expanded to a group of states who don't necessarily agree with the rules of those states. So I actually have a very pessimistic view of the future of Schengen, and I'm quite inclined to suggest that the best thing that could happen to the EU right now is to let Schengen collapse and then rebuild Schengen 2.0 based on a common consensus that everyone signs up to. Because right now, the, this fundamental discrepancy about what basis we all agree that we should have internal movement within Europe is, is just not sustainable um, without having that fundamental uh, political agreement. Uh, Jonathan and Jeremy, I, we are over time and we're getting the evil eye from the coordinators. So if you can, just 15 seconds for each, just give us your plug. So sorry. We, we need to have another session. I'm going to bargain next year for two sessions. 15 please. seconds on what? On whatever you want. Oh, whatever, I, uh, whatever I want. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Um, 
what the future what the future holds I'm a public official so I cannot agree with Liz's rather dystopian view uh, I think by the end of this year we will have a global compact on migration that is going to help reinforce the benefits of migration and better control its challenges if one thing is clear it is that, by definition, migration involves one person crossing from one country into another. To manage it better is going to demand international cooperation. And if states are unable to develop that cooperation, then I'm afraid Liz is right. A world of dystopia does, in fact, threaten. But I don't believe that, because I'm a smiley, upbeat British person. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, beat that. Very quick. Uh, aid to frontline states, what's more being, what is being done to capacitate them? The World Bank is getting into that in a big way, which I think is a very important development, and that was going to be like a five-minute answer, but there's 10 seconds. Um, I am optimistic. I'm probably not optimistic on a three- to four-year timeline, but I am optimistic on a five- to ten, certainly a ten- to 20-year timeline, and here's why. There's a big generational divide in views on this. And if you, if you look at what has freaked everybody out on this issue for the past couple of years, it's the election of Donald Trump and the Brexit vote, both of which were very narrow and both of which showed a really significant generational divide. I think as the, as the younger generations take over more and more of the voting populations in uh, certainly the US and the UK and I think in much of Europe, you're gonna see a more positive attitude towards migration. The question is, can we hold together some of the core political institutions and protections until we see that sort of a political tide shift. And I'm optimistic we can when I look at things like the refugees welcome movement, the airport protests that accompany the Trump refugee ban and so on. It's not, a, you know, it's a close call, but I'm quite guardedly optimistic. Okay, you heard Schengen 2.0, compact on migration, and in about five to 10 years, it's gonna look a lot brighter. All right, we'll end with that. Thank you so much. Thank you.